Good morning, everybody. It is Will Kelly, and we have the one and only Sam Gustin here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So um, we are going to do this live together. And today's topic, uh, we are talking about how to triple your business during the spring rush. So um, Sam, thanks for coming out. Yeah. I definitely appreciate it. Maybe give the viewers just a little quick snapshot of kind of like where you're at in business. Sure. And um, obviously, we've had you on the podcast prior, but um, it's been a little while, so yeah, um, and we've grown a little bit. So. We have, we have, yeah. Was, I think last year, last spring, uh, we were we came to your shop, and we have things have changed quite a bit. Uh, a little bit about us is we are starting our second location here in Austin, Texas, uh, Georgetown, Texas, to be specific. Our our official first day is going to be March 11th, so that's coming up here in about a week or so. Uh, but our main location is uh, is about three years old. And this year, between the two locations, we're hoping to do about 1.1 million in sales for the year. And uh, our primary location, uh, we're hoping to be sticking around like 800,000 for the year, uh, but entering profit mode. And then the second location, uh, we have ambitions to do 300,000 in the first year. Uh, not really focused on profit too much, just trying to grow as fast as we can. And then that way, once we get to that 500K mark, maybe year two, two and a half, we'll flip on profit and start taking some distributions. Yeah. From that second location. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So the reason why I'm I'm <laughs> grateful that Sam is on this with us live right now is because uh, I'm a huge proponent on seeking advice from people that are where you want to be. Mm -hmm. And I know for a lot of the viewers, like when they watch YouTube and they see these guys like like maybe Mike Andes or you know, some of these other super successful uh, people, you know, they they're they're not like deep, deep into the weeds of doing it each day. And although you have built close to $800,000 business last year, uh, over the last few years, like what's awesome is you and I are literally both starting our second location. Yeah. So like everybody that's literally watching this, that is starting their business and trying to grow and double and triple in the spring rush, like we're literally doing it. Yeah. And so um, I think it's awesome because you guys are hopefully going to be able to gain value from us we're literally doing it alongside with all of you guys. So at the end of this live event, we are going to open up for Q and A. So make sure to put any questions that you guys have down in the uh, comments. So I'll go up and throw this banner here. But um, what I wanted to talk to you about, Sam, and uh, you, th those of you guys <laughs> that are watching, is I just want to make sure that the audio is good. If it is, let us know in the comments. Um, but what I wanted to ask you, Sam, is so... Obviously, you've built a successful business, right, um, at your first main location. So mm. how does having that knowledge that you've had, like now going into your second location and like building that, what does that framework or mindset look like, that approach look like? Is it like because you have that knowledge already, like what does that kind of approach look like and how well equipped do you think you are to really starting that second location because you've already done that first one? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, when you're first starting off your your lawn care business, for us with solo operators uh, and trying to just grow and soak up as much information as possible, you have to go through a lot of expensive, whether that's money or time, um, a lot of expensive mistakes or learning learning curves. And what I get to tell my general manager here for our second location is I've already I've already got all the gray hairs, so you don't have to get the gray hairs. Like I already know what hurdles you're going to hit when you're going to hit them. And we get to scale this a lot quicker than what I had the ability to scale it when I was solo. And so I just need you to uh, follow my lead with the second location. Uh, trust the KPIs, trust what I'm telling you. But even more importantly than that, I don't have all the answers still. Um, so it's the mindset that we're going in with the second location is we don't have to go through those same headaches that we went through. Um, the headaches will be there, but we won't have to figure out how to overcome those headaches real time. Like we've already know what to do to get through certain hurdles. And um, I get to tell, I tell, I'll tell our operations guy, Dylan, um, I'm like 2024 is going to be the, the most important year for troops mowing. Uh, so if we can like, look like 40 years from now, we'll look back on the success or the failure of our company and say it was because of 2024. And what I mean by that is we get to really experience what a full, um, profitable location looks like. And at the same time, get to experience what a brand new location looks like in real time in the same year. 
And so we get to learn how to operate. Like what will a GM do at a full location? What will a GM do at a brand new location? And if we can dial in systems in 2024, in theory, we can just copy and paste those for all of our other 10 locations because 12 locations is the goal. And so this year is going to be um, not necessarily headache for the general manager of the second location. It's going to be a headache for me trying to figure out what systems need to be dialed in for two locations at a fully functional 800,000 year location and then at a brand new location. Uh, I hope that answers yeah. that question a little bit. Absolutely. It does. It does. So um, as you're as you're starting the second location, you said March 11th is mm-hmm. this, is a start date. That's super exciting, yeah. man. Like I, you're, you're probably getting all your ducks in a row, getting the LLC set up and like really just getting all of that pre start, you know, set up. Mm-hmm. What, um, like what goals do you have set and what, what is your target for this year? So like, obviously you have that second location starting, but like what, what actionable steps are you taking to reach the goals that you have set and what are those goals that you have for year one in the business? Yeah. So primarily it's going to be, um, getting to $20,000 a month as fast as possible. And we have, you know, revenue incentives for that general manager to do that. Um, getting to 55 star reviews as fast as possible, because we believe that that pays dividends going forward throughout the years. Um, and really just trying to, trying to learn exactly what systems need to be implemented more, more so like there's a goal of like, we want 300,000 a year profit is just going to be what it's going to be. Um, I don't really have expectations for profit this year, year one, I just want growth. And so profit is whatever I would love to be set up to be a 300,000 year company. Now, what that means on December 31st of the end of this year, if the top line does not show 300,000, that doesn't mean we didn't hit that goal. But basically what I'm saying by 300,000 year company is, are we set up to for a 300,000 year company, January 1st, 2025? Like, do we have enough trucks, employees, systems to be a 300,000 year company starting off? And then, you know, using that as our benchmark for 2025. Uh, those are kind of our, our goals and really just, you know, learning as we go is, is uh, the ultimate goal is because at 2025, I want to have copy and paste systems for future locations. Yeah. I love the question. So I tuned into one of Mike's live events where he was doing calls and you asked the question of in, as a new GM, how are you incentivizing them? And I love the way that he answered that question. I love the question mm-hmm. and I love the way that he answered it because in, in the most simplistic form, he basically said, you want to pay them based on what you want to happen. Mm-hmm. And so he says it a lot, but when he broke that down of like the first year, your focus is top line, Mm -hmm. gross revenue, right? Growing the business, it's not profit. And so he literally said like, I think to my understanding that like he doesn't even really, there's no profit in that first year anyway. Mm -hmm. So what you wanna incentivize is that top line. I thought that was a really good question that you asked him. Yeah, thank you. And he he helped me open up my eyes and I'm sure all of his answers made my GM really happy. Uh, because we were going to do 15% distributions, uh, not necessarily profit sharing, but they would get 15% of distributable income. Mm-hmm. And we've, we've defined what that is for our company. And, uh, but this probably wouldn't be a whole lot of bonuses to be made in that first year. And so what we're doing now is we're giving them a 15% cut of monthly revenue at certain checkpoints. So if he hits 20,000 a month, two months in a row, which means just one month isn't a fluke, uh, he would get 15% check. And so that's $3,000 check to him as a general manager. And then we have a $30,000 checkpoint, $40,000 checkpoint. After 40,000, he switches to a distribution uh, distribution model. Yeah. So and I'm sure he, he likes that. And then that helps us um, keep the finger on the pulse for our general manager, where if he's money voted, money motivated, which he is, uh, he's going to you know bust his butt to get to those, those checkpoints. And ultimately, getting to those checkpoints helps me collect distributions and uh, distributable income, which is ultimately the goal, you know, as any business owner is to um, be compensated for your hard work. Absolutely. Right? And, uh, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you talked about Sam that your goal for year one is to hit $20,000. So a lot of people look at s- like sales and like, you know, getting, getting the type of work. I think the second component to that, once you get that or, or are working up to that from zero to 20 K a month, the other aspect of that is the structural component of that. How 
what do we need to be able to support $20,000 a month? So what have you with your numbers and a number of employees, number of trucks, what does that structurally look like at $20,000 a month uh, for you in, in, in the business? Yeah. So how we have it, how we're going to have our system broken down is we're going to have like Augusta, they have command center or we, we don't have a name for it. A command center would be good branding for troops mowing. Um, but we're going to have an office that handles all calls, all emails, all everything for every location. So, you know, at 12 locations, probably depending on the size, one and a half employees in the office needed per location or uh, one, probably like 0.75 office employees per location, I guess is how we could word that. Um, but we can we can pretty much see like 120,000 a year is a good goal in revenue per employee. So if we break that down to 20,000 per month, in theory, we could just use two employees. Um, but one of those employees would be the working GM. So we might need like two employees and have the GM kind of start keep pushing sales and everything like that. Um, I, I hope that that answers it a little bit in terms of our structures, how many employees we would need. Uh, probably two trucks at that point for 20,000. Uh, two mowing setups. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you've already done market territory. So I, what I see a lot is like, I get a lot of asked questions of like people saying like, Hey, should I do EDDM or should I do these, these other marketing strategies? Right. Like, um, what, like, do you, do you do market research before you, you start that location and like figure out like, okay, how many door hangers are we going to do this year? Like, like, I guess, talk, talk me through that, the marketing strategy going into building a business. Cause as it stands to my understanding, like you're at, th there's no revenue yet, ideally coming in over the last maybe 90 days at that location. So getting to that 20 K a month, like what does that marketing strategy approach look like? Yeah. Great question. So what we what we like to do is we like to have very loose um, service area territories for our primary location. So it's like, um, the huddle, huddle location is our primary location. That's one going to be doing 800,000 a year. We have very loose service territories because we want to kind of see where all of our customers are on a map and have like a heat map of where a new location should be. So like this off season, we had a lot of Georgetown customers. And so we're like, well, we're going to break this off into a different location. And right now we have 35 customers for the Georgetown location starting off. So day one, he's going to be doing maybe 4,000 a month in revenue already starting off. Uh, for the first location. Now, next year we have like 60 customers already in Pflugerville. So now we're going to start doing like marketing in Pflugerville, um, which is a weird name for a city, but it's down there by us. And we, we already know exactly what neighborhoods, what service areas are going to be hot in terms of um, who's going to be choosing us as long-term provider because we already have our footprint in those areas. Um, so now for Georgetown, what we do is we know that if we want 300,000 a year in revenue, and let's say we can get like 1500 a year in a, per client on average, uh, you have to break that down. So that's 200 customers. So now we have to ask ourselves if we already have 35, let's go 30 for easy math. We need 170 more customers for Georgetown to hit our 300,000 year goal by just breaking 300,000 divided by 1500. So how do we now go about getting 170 customers? And that comes down to knowing your numbers, which is, you know, customer acquisition cost. So if it costs us 40 bucks, I mean, I don't have a calculator right in front of me, but if it costs us 40 bucks um, to get a customer, we multiply that by 170 and that'll be our total marketing spend in theory to get to 200 customers. And then you can take it one step further where it's like, I know with door hangers, we'll get a 1% conversion rate in terms of like getting leads in. And then for that, new location, since we'll have a lower hourly rate, let's say our close rate is 60%. You just run all those numbers and you can like pretty much say like, I need to put 30,000 flyers out and I will get 200 customers based on my numbers. So that's like when people say, know your numbers, like if you know your customer acquisition costs and close rate, you can pretty much determine how much, um, how many flyers, how much money you have to put into marketing and then just dialing in which areas you want um, to service. Typically for us, we, we kill new developments. Uh, cookie cutter lawn, lawns less than 4,000 square foot of lawn. Like that's our bread and butter. We'll do that every day. So I'll find new developments and I'll just market the crap out of those, yeah. those neighborhoods. So what are you typically charging for a lawn cut for that cookie cutter 
cut our price. So we do minimum. So our minimum is going to be $48 per service, whether it's one blade of grass or 4,000 square feet. Yeah. So from zero to 4,000 square feet, we do 48 per cut. And that's where in, in lawn care, that's the minimums is where you really make a lot of your profit um, because uh, you're still paying your employees, you know, 33% or whatever it is on P for P. Um, but since it's not going to take them the full production rate, um, since you're charging your minimum, like let's say it's a 2000 square foot property, uh, at $48 per cut with our hourly rate, it's like 0.46 budgeted hours is what that would kind of come out to. Um, but it's not going to take them poor 0.46 budgeted hours. So now there's more capacity in your schedule. If you can fill your, your whole schedule with minimums. Yeah. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I love the way that you, you break it down, right? Cause I get, I get so many questions and speaking of questions before I jump into this guys we are doing a Q&A at the end of this so make sure you guys are putting your questions in the comments I already see some coming in mm -hmm. we'll go ahead and do some open open it up for Q&A at the end here so we'll make sure to go through them I love the way that you break down the backwards thought process right mm -hmm. so like where is the end goal and how do I get there and work my way backwards and it really is as simple the reason I asked you what is the price per cut right so you can sit down and look, okay, if I charge roughly $50 a cut, how many of these cookie cutter lawns do I need? Okay, if I'm going every other week during the regular growing season, that's 26 weeks, right? Like, then you can start to do the math on, okay, how much revenue is that going to make? Is that going to get me to my goals? How many customers do I need? How many employees can do that many customers per cut? And like, you really kind of work backwards instead of just trying to kind of you know, just kind of throw, throw it out there and just kind of see what you get, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so I, I think that that's really good. Um, I want to transition into a more of a tactical question. Okay. This, this is more, more so for me because I asked James with, uh, with the yard dogs and it seems simple, but I don't think it's as simple. So I'm nervous. Uh, it's, it's simple. Trust me. <laughs> okay. So do you guys do fertilization and weed control? Not weed control, just fertilizer. Okay. So, um, whether it's for mowing or fertilizing, do, do you give your customers like a hard date of like, hey, we're coming out to do that treatment on Wednesday or whatever? And if so, do you give a plus or minus for scheduling delays, right? Because as we grow, like there's things constantly changing. Employees sometimes don't show up, weather, equipment breakdown. I'm curious how you handle like when you have a hard ish date of like, Hey, we're going to be there. Or are you just like, Hey, we're going to be there this week. Like, how do you handle that? We give them the exact day. Really? Exact day. And I've thought about doing the plus or minus one. Um, but the, the pro of doing plus or minus one does not add up to the cons in my opinion. And what I mean by that is the pro of saying, we're going to be there on Wednesday, plus or minus a day. So that means in the customer's mind, they have a work schedule. Some customers leave their dogs outside. So they're like, will they be here Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday? Like they, they just don't know. And so the pro is for the company only. There's no pro on the, on the um, customer side by saying plus or minus one. And at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a firm believer. If you don't take care of your customer, somebody else will. And so one way that we can take care of our customers is respecting their schedule. And by saying, we're going to be there on this day. Now, to your point, Will, some things do happen where it's like rain happens, employees call off, equipment breaks, where it's like, shoot, there's out of 70 customers today, there's going to be 10 that I have to push off to the next day. What we have found is our customers actually, um, they, they gain a lot of trust by us communicating, hey, we can't be there today because of X, Y, and Z. This is against our character as a company, but we will be there. You're going to be our first priority tomorrow morning. And what we found is they actually love that over communication. And then we have, you know, 200 five star reviews in our Google page. And I'm sure if you were to go through there, 40 percent of them are talking about our communication and reliability. And so if like, hey, we're going to be there Wednesday, if we're there Wednesday, they love it. It's like there's no other lawn care company that will be there when they say they're going to be there. And on the one time that they can't be there, they've communicated why and when they will come. And so we found that the plus or minus one is a model that doesn't fit with our brand because we we charge a higher price but that price comes with reliability and exceptional service both on and off the property which you know, ultimately is our mission statement yeah so i love that dude yeah. that that you sold me on that yeah. so that, that that was good that was good yeah I, I was curious because um i know 
other companies they'll do the plus or minus mm -hmm. and so we're still trying to kind of figure it out we're, we're test testing it this yeah. season and we're already figuring out that it's like hey we used to do the hard day and it was very communicative and the customers do like that but and i like what you said like we're here to serve the customer mm -hmm. and so as much as we can right as you scale there's certain things you got to kind of cut out but um, i like that a lot so we are talking about tripling their business your business our business and hopefully their business um what do you think like what are some like key things that 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 somebody can do who's maybe just getting started uh in the season um that they can hopefully try to triple like are there like a couple things that that are really priority do you think so obviously i, I really liked what you said about getting you know 50 55 star reviews mm -hmm. like Anybody listening to this, take notes. Seriously, yeah. Yeah. Sam's done this before. He knows what the levers are to pull. Mm -hmm. And so, um, what 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 other things do you think will make a difference in in hopefully somebody's business that is wanting to grow in their in their early stages? Yeah, it it I would have two different answers depending on their situation. So, do you have more time or do you have more money? Uh, if you have more time. Uh, I would spend a lot of my focus on creating loyal, raving customers. And so it's like, if I only have five lawns on my schedule today, I am going to make those five lawns look like Picasso came and took care of their lawn, right? And then I'm going to knock on their door and say, hey, you know, I have some extra time in my schedule. Do you mind if I pull some of your weeds? I'm not even going to charge you. It's like, you have a lot more time than money by creating loyal, raving customers. That's going to be your cheapest customer acquisition source that you can, that's free customers. They're going to tell their whole neighborhood about it. Uh, Will with military long cuts, he did above and beyond, blah, blah, blah. Um, I recommend him, you know, a hundred times over. And so that's what we did in the first two years of our company. We spent $0 in marketing and got up to 300 customers with zero in marketing because we built the first 20 customers was loyal customers. And we went above and beyond, but we call them gold star customers. So even if those first 20 customers call in today, I'll bend over backwards for them personally. Like I'll go to their yard and pull a weed on a Saturday uh, because they are the ones that really built my company for me. And so um, I would recommend if you have more time, go above and beyond for your customers, serve your customer or else somebody else will serve them for you. And I'm like a big uh, believer in that. Now, if you have more money, dump it into marketing, figure out like, um, a few neighborhoods that are cookie cutter lawns that you can do minimum prices on. And when you're selling them on the job, if they submit an estimate, say it's like, wow, it looks like, you know, you got our best price that we could possibly give. you got our minimum pricing. Um, would Tuesday or Thursday work this week? It's like at your size of company, if you're starting off, you don't need to have dialed in service dates uh, or dialed in routes because it's like you have scattered customers all over the place. Um, just use psychology of selling to get them on the schedule. And so if you have a lot of money, dump it into marketing and really prioritize your sales process so that you can maximize your um, capital efficiency, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And anybody that's watching here. So just so you know, Sam, don't do that. <laughs> Sam did a live call with, with uh, one of Caleb's customers and literally sold them live. Okay. Is it, is that on your channel? Is that, yeah, is that I think it's a short channel? on my channel. Yeah. Okay. If, if, if you haven't already, listen, go to Sam Gustin's YouTube channel, hit that subscribe button. I'm telling you the Thank value you. that he is giving out is phenomenal. I've been watching some of his content and it's absolutely incredible. Thanks man. You are a professional when it comes to selling. So I guess talk me through there. If there, there's one thing, let me build this up that I know in life is true. Like you're like the book seller be sold by Grant Cardone. Everybody you're either being sold by something or you're selling someone in all aspects of life, in marriage, in relationships, in business, in friends, friendship, like where you want to go when you get off of work for dinner, you're trying to sell, hey, let's go to this pizza joint, right? Mm -hmm. Like everything we do in life, we're selling or we're being sold. Um, so talk me through, because obviously you have a gift of, of talent, of selling people in a servant caring way, right? not a, you know, kind of like negative approach to yeah. sales, right? Like we're, we're here to help and serve people. Where did you, how did you get that foundation? What books have you read or listened to? What, like, it, does it just come with practice? Like, how do you, did you work a job where you did sales? Like, like talk to me about that. And then 
maybe like uh, the one or two kind of like biggest maybe tactics or best practices uh, or recommendations, advice that you can give to somebody who's learning sales? Yeah. Thank you for the kind words. I get really weird when I get compliments. Like, I don't know. I just, I'm thinking I'm sweating right now. Um, honestly, I've just always been a little hustler, man, since I was like a little kid. Like I, I remember I would like draw pictures in like second grade and tried selling them for nickels. Like I've just been weird like that. Um, I did, after the army, I did work a sales job for a tech startup in Austin and I helped them like develop their sales systems. Um, but to me, sales is just like building rapport and feeding off of people's energy. And to me, it's like, if, if somebody answers the call and they're like, what? It's like, well, I'm not going to ask you how you're doing. Like read the room type of thing. Like just get to the point with that person. If somebody answers the phone, they're a nice old lady. You can clearly see that they're like talking with a smile over the phone. It's like, I'm going to like not flirt, but I'm going to throw on some charm and like get her to smile and like on the phone and then, you know, close the deal. And when it, when it comes to like tactics, you really have to, um, you have to go about it with curiosity. So it's like, if I'm talking with somebody on the phone and they, they say like, Hey, I'm getting other estimates and this other company is $10 more affordable than, than you. And like, I'm not, let's say a biweekly frequency. That's like a typical objection we'll get is pricing. Um, so I'll ask them like, do they currently have a lawn care provider? And they'll typically will say yes. Cause that's a lot of people are not first time lawn care cu customers. Uh, I'll say, yes. I'm like, well, what are they doing? That is not, um, uh, what are they doing that is making you look for other services? And they'll say whatever's wrong with their company. And I'm like, well, how, how many customers or how many companies did you reach out to, to get an estimate? And they'll say five. I don't know. I'm like, well, how much time has that taken you? Were they like instant quotes or did you have to wait for emails? And typically with, with this industry, it's not over the phone, right? It, like they'll get a few days to get an estimate out to them. And so I'll basically just say, like, well, yes, we are $10 more, um, more pricey than your current provider or than the current estimates that you're getting. Uh, but obviously it sounds like the reason that you are reaching out is because somebody's not being reliable. They're not easy to communicate with. And it's unfortunately has affected, you know, part of your week, right? You're taking a lot of time to go out and search for estimates. And I would basically just like to ask you, Mrs. Jones is, is $10, you know, $10 more a month worth peace of mind, knowing that you never have to do this again. And then typically we'll get the, the sale because they realize it's like, yeah, $10 is stupid. Like I did take a few days to get estimates and, they do have 200 five star reviews and um, they are easy to communicate with. They got me the pricing immediately and I'll just kind of rely on that. It's like, hey, man, like our mission statement is to provide reliable and exceptional service both on and off the property. I'm not currently on your property. So may I ask if I'm providing you know, reliable service off the property for you right now? And they'll be like, yeah, I'm like, can you imagine what we would do on the property? And is that worth ten dollars more to you? And if they say no, like, well, I mean, they're probably not going to say no. Um, so you kind of just go at it with curiosity and ask questions yeah, and kind of like pull out their heartstrings a little bit. It's like, yeah, maybe I will pay 10 bucks to never have to do this again. Dude, this, listen to me. If you guys didn't pick up on anything at all, just go back and rewind that last minute and a half. That is solid. That's probably the number one most objection we get is, is price and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I think one of the, one of the biggest pieces that I'm learning in, as, as I grow my sales, cause I've really like shot up over the last probably 45 days. I read, I listened to the book seller be sold. Thank you, Caleb for the recommendation. Um, and I'm really starting to learn this, but I think the key is getting data, mm -hmm. like going in, like you said, in, with curiosity, you have to ask 101 questions before you even get into your spiel and give them what, what you, and that's what I failed to do last year. Yeah. People would call me and I'd say, Oh, you need, you need weed control. And they say, Hey, I, Hey, I got weeds in my lawn. Great. Let me tell you about my program. There's eight, eight treatments every six weeks, fertilizers, pre-emergence, weed control. Here's the price. And it's like, but you didn't bring any pain up, right? Yeah. Like, like, Hey, what, what, what have you, what have you tried to treat for the weeds? Have you used another company? Yes, we have. They didn't show up. The weeds are still there. Well, great. Um, you know, have you, have you tried anything over the counter, Home Depot, Lowe's? And they're like, yeah, we've tried Scott's and it's like, great. How, how was the results? Mm -hmm. And they'll still say it's not good. And so like, you're, you're, you're again, showing them like the reason they're calling you is they need help. And yeah. like, we're here to help, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm so much better now. And then, uh, the other thing that I learned from you also 
which I'm sure I've heard before, but when one of your videos, I think it was um, a double close. So just number like assuming the sale, double close. Hey, mm-hmm. this is the weed control price. Did you want to start next week or the following week? Mm-hmm. And you're just, you know, giving equipping them with the option to be the decision maker, yeah. you know, of of having one of the or one and or, you yeah. know, instead of just like, hey, did you want to get on the schedule? Yes or no. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's cool. It's and it's like if you think about cold calling, which even though I, I wouldn't consider it cold calling, like if somebody has already requested an estimate, you've sent out the pricing, now you're calling to follow up with them after a few days because you haven't gotten an answer. Typically that phone call sounds something like, hey, Mrs. Jones, or is this Mrs. Jones? She'd be like, depends, who's like, who's calling? Like, well, this is Sam with Troops Mowing, how are you? And like, that's how typically every call goes. And then the sales man or woman will just go into their spiel. And it's like, you, the person just like, wasn't expecting this phone call. They're like, the gosh, this person's talking too much. You kind of have to go in and like, um, rewired like their expectations of a phone call. And so like, Hey, Mrs. Is this Mrs. Jones? Like, yeah. Like, well, this is Sam with Truce mowing. Hey, I'm looking at your estimate. Like, do you mind if I ask you like a, a quick question? And I kind of sound like concerned almost. And she'd be like, sure. And it's like, well, our office managers told us like, there's two more slots in your neighborhood and looking at your pricing and hopefully it's a minimum price because it's easy to sell. It's like looking at your pricing, like, that you have it's great news like you have like the, literally the lowest you could possibly pay for our company and since we only have two more spots in your neighborhood i'm just curious if like i could make you the lucky person that gets to like reserve our place on our schedule and like you're not asking them like can i get your money you're like can i make you the lucky person just like there's a different way to reword things mm-hmm. that like break circuits in people's brains and like kind of like kills defense mechanisms and you know if they say yes or no you can just be like if they say no you know you can go a different direction and be like, well, may, may I ask you like why you reached out to us for an estimate? And it's like, cause you probably need long care services and then it's going to go to pricing. And then, then you handle that pricing objection. Like we just talked about, uh, you're just trying to navigate the conversation for them. And, and I, I like to watch a lot of Andy Elliott content. And one of his biggest things for auto sales is word tracks. And so at the end of the day, you don't want to have to rely on like you talking fast because you got nervous because they brought up an objection. You want to have word tracks where you become a robot when someone says price it's like okay and i'm going to go on this word track because if, am i ten dollars more uh expensive well how many days have you been doing this and da, 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 da. so one thing i'm working on for our company is developing word tracks for sales on certain objections so that i could just give a sheet to a, an office person and say if they say we're too pricey say this like say literally word for word this uh, so that's one thing we're working on yeah yeah, that's yeah. awesome. I do like Andy Elliott also. Yeah. I'm learning a ton from him. One of the things that, that me personally I'm working on is like getting the customers to say yes so many times. Mm-hmm. So like even when I call, like I literally get a submission form two minutes later, I'm calling and I'm already mapping it out. And so I say, hey, hey, Sam, um, this is Will with Military Long Cuts. Uh, I see we got a submission form uh, for, for, for your address. Uh, I for, I just want to make sure that 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 was you that filled that out. Mm-hmm. They say yes, yeah. right? And it's so like again, it's, it's it's a curiosity approach. And then when I'm like giving the pricing too, ninety nine percent of the time it's for the front and backyard. Yeah. So as I'm going through the, the the pricing, I'm like, okay, so I just want to make sure this is for the front and back, right? Mm-hmm. And then it's like yes. So I'm asking. They're almost like kind of dumb questions to you and I because we're just like. But, but again, it's, it's, it's them saying yes, you know, five, 10 times by the time we get to the, to the offer at the end, they're like, yeah, sign me up. You know, I'm going to add one thing that's going to change your whole, your whole process. So that is gold. You want to get everybody to say yes, but when you ask for the sale, they're already predetermined to say no. So even though they said yes, a hundred times, they are going to want to say no when you ask for the sale. So you need to word that last question you're asked to where no is the right answer, right? So it's like, Will, is this mm. you that did the estimate? And then when you get to your ask, you can say, would you be offended or would you be against us putting you on the schedule? And the correct answer there is no. So, and so if they say no, I'd be like, awesome. So you would not be, so it sounds like you wanna be on our schedule. So you want them to say yes, they wanna say no so bad to the ask, mm. give them the option to say no, when it's really a yes. I gotcha. That, that, that makes sense to me too, because like from the client standpoint, they're probably so prone to saying yes, yes, yes. And then it's like, 
at some point they got to say no. Yeah. Right. But if you do that right before the end offer of like getting them on the schedule, they got it out. Yeah. Right. Of like, no. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. dude, that's, that's powerful. Yeah. That, that's really yes, good. Sir. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, outside of that, Sam, did you have maybe any other questions or stuff that you wanted to maybe bring up before we get in the Q and a here? No, I mean, got about 15, 16 people watching here. Yeah. Cool. Um, really my question would be for you just to explain like how you're going to go in about opening your second location. And then, you know, we could get into the questions after that, but I felt like I've been the one talking here. So I'd like to hear your point of view. Yeah. So, uh, our flyers for the second location are starting to go out on Monday, uh, actually Tuesday, they're getting picked up on Monday. We've already been sending out flyers for our main location. Um, to be honest, you like, as of right now, we already have gained like 60 new customers collectively. Um, we've been sending out EDDMs over the last two weeks, we put a killer offer. Um, you know, they get their first treatment completely free, which is better than true green because mm -hmm. they do 50% and they make you sign up for the whole year. Yeah. There's no contracts with us, no obligations. Um, so I'm getting a little sidetracked on that as far as like building the second location. Um, but I, I did want to mention too, one of the other things that, that I'm, I'm, I'm going through like an MBA course with Mike Andes and he talks about a like social entrepreneurship and like building a bigger why. So um, one of the things that we're really leaning into, especially with you being veteran, veteran owned, and like anybody else out here that's watching to uh, give to a good cause. When I'm on the phone with a customer and they say, oh yeah, my, uh, my husband served in the army. What we do, I pick up on that like in sales and I'm like, wow, like, okay, thank you for, your, for their service. Um, we, de we definitely appreciate it. And I, I tell them like, we literally, every dollar we make in our business, a percentage of that goes to uh, sending care packages to deployed soldiers overseas. And like people want to rally around that. Yeah, so even cool. if it's five or 10 bucks more, like they want to rally around that. Like people are willing to spend more money to help a good cause. Um, if you think about those shoes, uh, Tom's back mm -hmm. in the day, dude, those shoes are not comfortable, man. <laughs> but people bought bought them because every shoe they buy, every shoe that gets purchased, another pair goes to somebody in need overseas. And so people are willing to, to sacrifice some quality, maybe price or even mm -hmm. speed to help a good cause. And that's something I'm really leaning into. Like the minute I pick up, like they're supporting veterans. I'm like, hey, let me just tell you, by the way. You know, we send care packages over every year. Um, sorry, I got a little, little bit. No, that's, that's genius. On that one. That's genius. Um, but it's it's helped tremendously. Yeah. Like, you know, having a, it's called social entrepreneurship. Like people want to support socially a good cause. And um, yeah, I think that's good. But um, as far as us, we already purchased the truck. We already got our GM in place. Um, it's really just about execution right now. We're doing door hangers every single day. Uh, next week, we're going back to five days a week. And we're doing door hangers. Uh, we're booking customers left and right. Obviously, we got the, the the logos on the truck. I'd say for anybody out there just getting started, that is probably the number one thing. Yeah. It's a moving billboard, and yeah. you know you can. It's it's and it kind of locks you in, right? Mm -hmm. If you go and if you have one truck and you're just getting started and you put the logos on, you can't just change your career tomorrow. Yeah. You, everywhere you drive, you have the logos on it. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just just pushing the door hangers, and I really like what you said about like um, really just taking care of those first 25, 50 customers, like they're gold. Cause mm -hmm. they are, yep. you know, that's, they give, the, they give you the confidence that this works mm -hmm. and it does if, if you, if you put in the hard work. Yeah. So. Yeah. Getting logos on the trucks was huge. Yeah. It was, it's cost 300 bucks for, you know, relatively cheap logo. And, um, mm -hmm. people will literally stop you and be like, can I have a card just yeah. because your truck? So, absolutely 100 percent. absolutely i think it separates you as well with the other competition that's out there that's just mm -hmm. doing it in a truck you and know? don't get a magnet yeah no magnet just like commit to a vinyl logo on the whole side of your truck it'll it'll pay for itself within a week i promise yeah cool let's see these questions man awesome all right so we're gonna jump into q a now we've got some people watching we'll start up here at the top um we'll just maybe go back and forth here sure if that works yeah all right um okay robert bailey said it's perfect oh this is probably for the audio yeah okay shout out to my mom uh what was the most difficult obstacle for the second location i think we can like if you have some stuff to put into i think this would this, sure. this is a great question so i would say the biggest obstacle for the second location for me personally was growing my leadership 
and ability to manage a manager. Like I didn't, un- I didn't know how to do it. I didn't understand it because it's, it, it, it's a big hurdle. Like to me, I think it's kind of easy once you get a couple employees, like you're just like the head octopus and the tentacles, like they just come to you. But to lead a manager is a different shift. It's, they have to lead themselves. Like you're not going to be there every day, every second, every minute. So how do you do that? And I think it really comes from becoming the best version of yourself that you can be eating, right? Exercising, being a trustworthy person and, you know, portraying that, that you are the leader you're getting there before them, you're leaving after them and just full circle 365 days a week. You know, nobody's perfect, but striving to be the best version of yourself each, each and every day to be that leader that some people would want to follow. Mm-hmm. I think would be big. Yeah. Lead by example. It's the whole army thing, right? Yeah. Um, you got to lead leaders. And so the only way to do that is to be, you know, a leader yourself. And if you have to lead your family as a husband, you have to lead, you have to lead yourself. And like, like you said, be disciplined uh, to go to the gym, even though I'm a little chubby right now, I'm still trying to lose some weight, but go to the gym, eat right. You got to be able to lead yourself and lead others. Yeah. Great point. I wouldn't have a whole lot of uh, knowledge here on the second location hurdles just yet, uh, but I can guarantee you, is this your mom? I can guarantee yeah. you, Miss Kelly, come December, I'll have a whole, whole few paragraphs for you on some obstacles. Absolutely. Can you see that or do you need me to read it? No, I, I can see a little bit. Do you want me to read this one? Yeah. All right. What's the best way to, to communicate with a customer? Uh, how do I how do I time mass text? And what is the line between good communication and annoying? Should I message after every service? Uh, I would view your communication to the customer as um, a precious asset. Uh, so if you blow up their phone with a lot of different messages that are not necessarily um, a necessity, you're going to lose the opportunity to upsell them when you need money the most. So if you're sending them invoices, you're sending them receipts, you're sending them happy birthday messages, like if you're just blowing up their phone, the time where you need to upsell flower bed cleanups, that uh, communication is not going to be as viewed as frequently if you're just constantly blowing up their their phone. Um, so I would I would save communication to the customer as like just a valuable asset and really only deploy that as um, as you see fit. Yeah, what we've done, Robert, is we've turned off all receipts. We've turned off all invoices. They don't get anything. We're similar to like Netflix. You sign up for the subscription, they just bill the card. They don't send receipts, they don't send invoices. The other thing that we do is we we only use text sparingly. And the, way, and the, the only two times we use text is number one, if we're sending a new estimate, we want that text to immediately ring. And then if we're sending somebody to collections, we do text them. Outside of that, we don't do a whole lot of texting. There might be a scheduling here and there. It's a customer request texting, but we try to keep texting to a minimum. Yeah. All right, Miss MJR. <coughs> All right, door hangers versus EDDM. What gives you a better conversion rate? Um. As far as conversion rates, I think they're both pretty similar from what I've seen. I will tell you that if you have the money, EDDM is cheaper. Mm -hmm. It takes longer to hand out door hangers. But in the beginning, most of the time, people don't have the money Mm -hmm. and they have the time. And so at that point, door hangers would probably be better fit. As you grow in scale, EDDM seems a lot more uh, like beneficial if you have a lot of team members and you know you have the money to to blast that out yeah eddm will allow you to to uh get past the no solicitation sign on people's houses uh we last few weeks we've sent out like four employees to go do um ten thousand door hangers and i told them just like if you see a not non-solicitation sign like from the sidewalk don't do it but if you don't see it till you get to the door still leave a flyer like you're already up there and we've gotten like three one-star reviews over the past two weeks because we're leaving trash on people's customer or people's doorsteps. And um, it's one of those things you just got to have to navigate, but EDDM will get you past the non-solicitation sign. Yeah, that's a really good point. Okay. All right. I'm trying to hire my second employee for the season. I've scheduled 11 interviews and no one has shown up any tips. 
Uh, hiring at the end of the day is a sales function of your business. Um, so you have to be able to sell the employees on why you are the company that they need to work for. And that happens before the in-person interview. Uh, so what you can do is that job description has to be above and beyond anybody or any other lawn care company's job description, um, provide purpose and direction for your company. And you need to position that job description so that way um, people feel like they hit the golden ticket that they are chosen for an in-person interview for your company. Now, when if they do show up, then it is also uh, a sales function where you're talking about your vision and your mission for your company. And that's why it's important to know where you are going over the next few years, because if you don't know where your company is going, you can't expect anybody to follow you. So ultimately, hiring is a sales function, and I would change my mindset to view it as such. Yeah, absolutely. Some One thing I'll add to that that I learned was texting. A lot of people text these days, text them. You should text them a confirmation with the date and the time. When you schedule the interview, you should also text them the morning of. That will help have them show up. Also, what we do is we send a video. So I shot a video of myself walking in front of our trucks saying, hey, this is why we're different. May choosing a job is a big decision. Yeah. And I let me help you make that. Here's what separates us. We pay based on performance. Our team earns 21 to 28 an hour. We give two weeks paid time off. We have company vehicles. We provide equipment, all that stuff. As much as they're trying to sell you, you're trying to sell them. And I tell our general managers that as well. As much as like they're coming to the interviews and trying to sell why we should hire them, we also need to sell them the opportunity of why they, they would want to work here. Mm -hmm. All right. Adam Burkett said, great video clap. Thank you, sir. I love Adam. He's an awesome guy. All right. Caleb, question for Sam. So when you set up a customer for a fertilizer package, you are going to say that the service will be on a Wednesday going forward, for example, no matter what. Yeah, so for our fertilizer, we choose not to hold a license for applicator's license in Texas, but you do not need a license for fertilizer as long as there's no weed control components in there. Um, consult your attorney. Um, don't come at me if you get in trouble for that one. Uh, but what we do is we schedule fertilizer applications for Fridays um, because we're not going to have hundreds of customers for fertilizers just yet. So typically we can do two crews out there on a Friday and we schedule them every six weeks apart. So we'll tell them, hey, Friday, March 22nd is going to be your first fertilizer application. If you happen to miss that first fertilizer application, we're doing a six round fertilizer. So the next one will be six weeks after March 22nd because uh, our bread and butter is going to be mowing and just typical lawn maintenance and pet waste removal. And we're not going to just like uh, we're not going to make our crews carry a spreader with them just in the off chance that there's a fertilizer job on a random Tuesday. So we keep our fertilizer job scheduled for Friday uh, and Fridays only and only a specific Friday every six weeks apart. Yeah. And right now at our new location, because we are just getting started, we also are scheduling our weed control treatments on Fridays. It's just, I think, easier doing it all on one day. And then we're mowing Monday through Thursday is how mm -hmm. we have it set up. OK, Robert says door hangers. Actually, I think this is. Is this yours or mine? You can do it. Uh, door hangers, what's the most effective way of handing them out? When I knock before I place the hanger, I can get about 130 in day in the day passed out versus 300 to 400 passed out not knocking. Um, To be honest, I mean, back in the day, we used to knock. I've knocked on my door, on my block and stuff. I feel as though that you could do more volume by not knocking. Mm-hmm. Um, there is, I mean, an argument of somebody could say, well, you could probably sell them better, but I think you're going to reach more people by just leaving the door hanger and putting four times the amount, three to four times out the amount than you can versus door knocking on every single one that may or may not want that service. So I would, I would recommend just doing the passing them out and not knocking that way you can get more volume. hundred percent agree. I mean, at the end of the day, nobody wants to be sold. So if you're knocking on their door on a Tuesday at noon, like they're probably not going to answer the door to begin with. And the people that do answer the door are probably not interested And the 0.001% that is interested are probably only going to want services that you don't even offer. Like they're going to be like, do you bag the clippings? We're like, no, it's like, okay, well then I'm not interested. So you might as well just, just play the volume game. And I think you would actually be more effective by just 
not even knocking and just pumping door hangers out. I will say, don't walk across lawns, go driveway to sidewalk to driveway because you are going to be roasted in neighborhood Facebook groups if you're walking across people's lawns. So uh, take a little bit extra time to walk on the driveways and sidewalks. Absolutely. All right. Would you say the volume passed out will do more than the chance of talking to someone in person? hundred percent. Yep. I'll let you take this one too. All right. My man, Adam, how do you guys manage email groups specifically on Copilot? Filter by tags, customer type. How do you separate customers within your CRM? Customers versus leads versus specific types of customers. Uh, this is this is something that I'm waiting on specifically for Copilot to refine. Uh, how we have it set up, Adam, is we have our um, estimate form automatically create the customer into our specific Copilot account based on zip code. Um, if you only have one account, don't have to worry about what I just said about zip code. Just automatically put them into your uh, CRM through a Zapier automation. And we have the customer type automatically set up to lead or to leads. And so uh, what we're working on right now is from my understanding in Copilot, uh, they are working on an automation to where if an estimate is accepted, it will change the leads type to customer. And so um, I can't really figure out a way around changing leads to customer unless it's uh, primarily a manual task, which you're just going to forget some anyways, if you have it uh, be extremely manual. So right now I'm not hyper focused on um, organize, organizing our customers based on leads or customer or anything like that. I'm just hyper focused on filling the schedule and the customer type doesn't matter to me at this point in time. I'm just waiting for Copilot to iron that out. Yeah, I want to actually jump in on this. So anybody that's doing 500,000 or plus, talk to Sam. This dude is a wizard when it comes to Zapier automations and building out like the admin side of of workflows and just automating things like he literally has saved us so much time money and energy and effort literally so thank you for yeah. that he, he set up our whole back end we're literally capturing leads firing off an email if they're out of our service area and we don't even have to do it because of him and he's allowing us to literally capture their information so when we do open up a location our third location down the road we have all of the numbers and all the addre address and all the phone numbers there because he helped us set that up. So anybody doing above 500K, I'm telling you, he can help you out for sure. If you guys ever feel bad about yourself, just come talk to Will for about 30 minutes and he'll talk you up. He'll make you feel good. He's <laughs> <laughs> um, Adam, I will I will say what, so the way that we have our setup, so in Copilot, the customer field, like when you go to customers, what I want that to read as is my recurring recurring customers. So that's where all of our mowing and weed control customers are. Now, if we have a, a one-time project customer, I, we will put them under customer parentheses one time. And so those are like st still customers, but I don't really count those because I'm looking for recurring revenue. Um, you know, those are way more easier to upsell. And then we also, um, I mean, outside of that, if they do drop, we put, uh, like the reason and we, and we label that as that customer type of like why they left. Um, okay. All right. So Robert, uh, do you require cards on file? How do you make payment easy and efficient for your services? So we do require a card on file for all of our customers. And uh, side note, we do pass our fees off to our customers. Um, it saved us $22,000 last year. So anybody doing roughly 500 K plus highly recommend handing off the fees, um, and then just disclaiming that in the estimates and invoices and stuff. But um, yeah, it makes it real easy. We do allow ACH right now. Copilot has the ability to do ACH. So anybody that is kind of like not okay with the 2.9% processing fees, you can always push them towards the ACH. Mm -hmm. But those are our only two options right now. Yeah, we also require card on file. It's going to save you a lot of stress. Uh, trying to collect cash, Venmo, check. It, it's a, a bookkeeping nightmare doing all of that. And so we do require card on file. Copilot makes it really easy to accept payments with a few clicks of a button. Um, if you're if you're on Jobber, I know Jobber makes it really easy to collect invoices as well. Uh, but for us, cards on file are, are uh, a requirement and I wouldn't operate my business without it. Absolutely. I agree. <coughs> all right. So... Uh, I think this one's yours. Okay. Uh, what's the difference between a CRM program versus an accounting program? Does one replace the other? Uh, I'm not sure if one can replace the other, but for uh, us, like a CRM program, 
is going to be um, the brains of your company. It's going to have all of your customers' information, your scheduling, your routing, your automations, communications. It is liter It is the single most important thing for a company, in my opinion, at scale. An, an accounting program like QuickBooks, it just helps you organize all of your expenses and, uh, and helps you with your profit and loss statement and your balance sheets. Uh, to me, we keep them completely separate. We don't integrate uh, our CRM with our accounting program. And uh, I, if, I don't know, does Copilot allow you to do like accounting and bookkeeping within the system? I know they have expenses and all that. I think they can link it. Yeah. But yeah, I would, I would personally recommend just keeping your CRM and your accounting program completely separate. And if you are doing over, let's say 200,000 a year, I would just hire a cheap bookkeeper and don't even get into your accounting program unless you're trying to access your P&Ls and, and balance sheets. Yeah, we keep ours separate. Yeah. All right. Well-dressed lad. If a truck is used for personal use, would magnets be okay to start? And then what, when a second truck is acquired, use vinyl? I'd say like, it probably depends on how much, like if it's fully personal use, I think a magnet is totally fine if you don't want to put those vinyl stickers on it because you do use it a lot with personal. I would say if it's like 50, 50, um, you know, especially if it's a truck, the, the vinyl, stickers on the truck will will show that you're a professional and not an amateur and so that's the image you want to portray if you're trying to build a company so when in doubt if possible i, I would strongly recommend that but if you're mainly using it for personal use yeah i think the magnet would be fine yeah i'll give i'll give you info so you can make your own decision well dressed lad um what i found is specifically in texas this might be across america as well is if you have vinyl logos on your trucks, you need to have commercial insurance because even if you are using it for personal use, if you have vinyls on your truck and you get into an accident, they're going to come after the company and, and not you. So you need to have commercial insurance. Um, if you are using it for personal use and you have commercial insurance, that's fine. Um, it's, it's a driving billboard, whether you're going to get your groceries or whether you're on a lawn, if there's vinyl logos, but from a legal standpoint, make sure you have commercial insurance so that you are protected because your company will will get slammed if if you get into an accident. Yeah, that's a really good point. All right, this guy said, uh, Daniel, hi from Tri-Cities, Washington State. Howdy. Howdy, howdy. We're down here in Texas. <laughs> All right. I'm looking at adding another crew. I live in rural areas and finding employees is difficult. If I can't hire another crew, it will hinder our growth. Do you have any suggestions on how to recruit? Um, if you can't hire another crew, but your capacity is limited, uh, your option there would be to raise prices so that you can get more revenue without having to get more employees. Um, do I have any suggestions on how to recruit in a rural area? Uh, I would, I would brand yourself as the best lawn care company in your rural area. I would pay your employees as such. And at the end of the day, people are trading their time for a paycheck. And if the paycheck is the highest, that's typically where people are going to work. Yeah, that's the number one thing people look at. Mm -hmm. I ask all my employees this, and that's the number one thing I talk about in my video when I send it to the interviews is our pay. Mm -hmm. So that is what we focus on. And and benefits too. Oh boy, that's my wife. Oh, let's go. Let's see. Morgan, we miss you. We haven't, we, we haven't met you yet, but... We wish you were here. Hope you're feeling better. And uh, okay, let's let's see. Said okay. What's been the most rewarding part of growing your business so far? Ooh, this is a good question. I think it's your time to answer, isn't it? No, just kidding. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. I would say the most rewarding part of growing my business is being able to lead and influence people in a positive by by making a positive impact whether that be my employees, whether it be the viewers, um, whether it be meeting Sam and Caleb and all my great, good, good friends, like through the channel and everything. I think, you know, people at the end of the day, we mow grass, right? And what really truly matters is the people. And so building a community that helps each other and makes a positive impact on each other's lives, not just in business, but in their personal life, you know, eating right, spiritually, um, professionally, 
it, it goes full circle. It's it's all about the people. So I'd say that's the most rewarding thing about business. Yeah, for for me specifically, um, to make a long story short, I feel like God has pushed me into opening up this locate or my business. And I think their ultimate reason for that is to help expand his kingdom. And so there's been opportunities with employees where I've got to share Jesus with them and um, same thing with customers. And so I think the most rewarding part of growing our business is to be uh, the hands and feet of Jesus in a lot of ways and um, to just yeah have, in, have impact on people's lives. Yeah, that's huge. Love you, babe. All right. Uh, we got probably like maybe five more minute, minutes on this because we just hit 60 minutes. Don't want to make it too long. Uh, so well-dressed lad, Daniel. I am also from Tri-Cities. Very cool. Y'all got to connect. If you're applying basic weed and feed, do you typically need a license? I'm aware it varies by state. Yeah, um, it varies by state. I know for Texas specifically, you don't need an applicator, applicator's license for fertilizer. Um, but you do need an applicator's license if you're applying like herbicides, pesticides, anything like that for hire. Um, I would just do a, a Google search for your state specifically and adhere to local laws or else I'm sure a hefty fine could be in your future. Absolutely. No money, no problems. I like it. If there are a lot of other companies, is that a good sign for business or oversaturated? Ooh, that's a good question. I think it could be both. I think it could be both. Uh, what you'll want to do is just separate yourself. What makes you different? And literally, I remember when I was first building our business, the first location, and it was such a struggle to find employees. I literally wrote up on the whiteboard back here. I said, why? What makes us different? And why do people want to come and work for us? Or why do customers want to come and pay for our services? And like, that's a constant question. I constantly ask myself, like my goal is to have a line out the door at military lawn cuts because we're the best place that people want to come and work, mm -hmm. right? Like we give snacks and benefits and PTO and on pay well, like, you know, we want to be that good company in the area that people want to come and work for while also pay for services. Yeah, I, I personally think it's the number one sign of a place that you should be at. So uh, if you see a lot of trucks in a truck, what I mean by that is unbranded trucks with beat up mowers going around and there's a lot of them. That is the number one sign for me that, hey, I want to put my my flag here for a new location because I know for a fact that I'm going to be better than them and have more reliable and exceptional service than them. Now, if I see a place where I see 15 different companies that have really nice branded trucks and top end mowers. I'm going to be like, it's going to be, it's a good sign that the price is probably going to be higher there um, because the, the level of professionalism is elevating the price to the customers, but there's going to be a lot of hefty competition. But if all you're going against is trucks in a truck, you can do things better and more efficient than them. And I think that's a great sign. Absolutely. Okay, Green Empire says, how has your weed and fertilizing programs gone in Copilot Will? Can you put all the chemical information on the invoices such as EPA and active ingredients? No, I cannot. Uh, it's still getting built out. What we're doing is we're just having the applicator put that stuff in the notes. So it is being tracked, what we're using, the products that we're using. But, you know, in a, in a scenario where, you know, they want to see the data, it's there, but it's not concise yet. Uh, what are some books you guys are currently reading slash listening to? I need to start reading slash listening to more books. Uh, I try to be in the Bible as often as I can. Um, but some books that I've read in the past that I liked a lot was Extreme Ownership by Jocko. Uh, that's that's one that I would recommend to really anybody. Yeah, I'm listening to one right now. Actually, Andy Elliott recommended it. It's called uh, Relentless. And it just talks about literally like being the one percent and like being the 1% means you're willing to do what the 99% peop of people won't. Yeah. And just having that mindset of being like relentless, it's pretty good. Yeah. I'll also look at that one. Okay. So Caleb said, when starting a second location, how many residential homes are you looking for your service area to have? I asked because my area has 15K homes. Obviously, the more the merrier. I think you can definitely build a business with 15,000 homes, a good solid business. Could you do a million dollars? Maybe if you add like a plentiful line of services, obviously if you're just keeping it simple services might be a little bit of a stretch to do a million dollars in a $15,000 or 15 home, 15,000 homes. Um, you just want to try to kind of do the math on that. I know down here in Texas, 
more often than not, people need their services. Yeah. So you you're, you're going to have more people that are asking since the weather and stuff gets pretty pretty warm down here. Yeah, there's a neighborhood that we service in our market that I think we've we are the like, the most prominent lawn care company in this neighborhood. There's 2,000 homes, and in that neighborhood alone, we have 200 customers. And so that sounds impressive, that's but that's only one percent of that neighborhood. And so if you break it down, it's like if you're going to saturate that neighborhood, maybe you're only doing one percent of that neighborhood. And if fifteen thousand homes that would put you at 150 customers is what would can be considered like saturating that area, mm -hmm. um, you would really have to with 150 customers to have a successful company, you're going to have to offer more services and um, be the best at those services, like really really hammer flower bed cleanup upsells, fertilizing, uh, leaf removal. That way you can increase your revenue per customer as much as you possibly can. Uh, Cause at 150 customers, if you're just mowing, that might be like less than 200,000 a year in revenue. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very good point. All right. I'm at the point of all I can handle solo. I am happy here, but I do want to grow. I'm worried about the cost slash large profit drop when I do hire my first. I'm also worried about holding on to them. Uh, any advice? So you are going to see a profit drop as soon as you hire your first employee, especially, especially if there's going to be like if your salary and you're not uh, in the field 100% of the time, you're going to have an overhead hit on your profit and loss statement. Um, if you want to, if you're happy solo, I would just raise prices on your on your least profitable customers and just maintain your most profitable customers and do less work and make more money. But if you really want to grow and scale, you would I would recommend you asking yourself, like, why? Uh, what's 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 the point of doing that? Because um, you really have to get over that, like five hundred thousand dollar hurdle for for it to be really worth it, in my opinion. Um, if you're willing, if you only want to stick around like 300,000, I, I would probably just recommend staying solo to, to be quite honest with you. Um, I know that's probably an unpopular opinion, but yeah, I'd say if you do want to grow, I, I think what Sam is talking about is, is 1000% true. Like you got to know why, because it's going to get hard. You're going to have employees leave. You're going to get one star reviews and you have to go back. You know, you're not going to want to get out of bed, but like, why are you doing this? And if you have a big enough, why you'll do it. If you do want to grow, I would, where you're at now, like Sam said, raise, raise prices and stack as much cash away as possible. So that way you can go deploy that and and get through that swing of the low profit part to where you could get up to maybe two or three trucks and then start making kind of more money that way. Yeah. And before we move on, I see that he commented that his concern is that he'll get worried. Or he'll, he's worried that he'll get bored solo. Mm -hmm. um, you, If you operate a solo company properly, you could be sitting at 75% profit. And so- if you're really busting your butt all year round, you can maybe do 120,000, 150,000 a year solo. And if you're 75% profitable, you're making yourself six figures a year. You can you can be bored all you want, but you also have six figures a year coming in for just mowing lawns. And if that's okay with you, and if your body can sustain that, I would I would stick with that route. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Leonardo, between 19 days restart, lawn care, mowing, grass, why? We are in March 2024. I do not know what that. I'm sorry, brother. I don't have to. I don't know what that means. Okay. Instead, Spencer Lawn Care continued to choose wrong mowers for his business. Lawn Care instead choose diesels mowers or grasshopper mower. I am unfamiliar with Spencer Lawn Care. We you know, know Spencer Lawn Care? Oh, I do. I do. He yeah, did. Sean. Yeah. yeah. He did. He did talk. Um, yeah. We don't use any diesel mowers or grasshopper mower. Just go with go with the mower that the dealer has nearest you. Leonardo. So if, if the dealer closest to you is Skag, use Skag because you're going to be in there for repairs and everything frequently. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. We got probably a couple more minutes on this um, and then we'll have to wrap this up. So Caleb says, what are some of the most time saving automations you've added to your business? Well, I'll tell you this year, Sam helped me set up that when a customer fills out a submission form on our website, depending on the location of the zip code, it will put it into that CRM because we have two co-pilot accounts. So if it's in Aubrey, it goes to the Aubrey account. If it's in Salina, it goes to Salina account. If it's out of those service areas, it, it, it fires off an email and we don't even have to do anything, which I already talked about earlier. That was huge. So thank you, Sam. Yeah. Um, what other kind of automations do you have? 
Um, I kind of copied Will's 20 days to close or um, was that Mike Callahan? I guess we kind of like did a 20 days to close automation. Granted, Copilot isn't extremely reliable with automations yet, but once they become extremely reliable, I'm going to be a nerd about all these automations. Uh, the 20 days to close basically takes as soon as you send out an estimate, it takes the customer through a 20 day follow up journey. And within there, we have two uh, or three ringless voicemail drops that we'll do. And we have one manual call. Uh, so it helps save a lot of office time, which ultimately is money. Um, come, come, you have to pay to an office to do all these tasks anyway. We, were, we broke that down with Will on this automation we built out for him. And it's like with how many leads he's had to input into his company over the past however many years, this automation would have saved him $700 in just adding a customer to the software. Yeah, because we were basically doing double entry. If somebody goes to our website that puts their information in, I'd have to like copy and paste that into our CRM. All that can be done through automation and automatically create that customer for you. All right. Okay, so David Rampone, is that where I'll get bored? David, it says you're you're 70. In Florida. Currently, well, that's awesome, man. If you're out, if you're 70 years old, if that's what that means, out there pushing, pushing a lawnmower, you're you're my inspiration. I'm yeah, be honest with you, absolutely, you're crushing it. All right, so we're gonna go through these last four responses, and then we're gonna wrap this up here. Italy, okay. Appreciate the support, David. Okay, so well dressed lad, what are your opinions on mixing your company with commercial and residential properties? Is this something recommendable? I think what you want to look at in the beginning, uh, again, our funnel was like this, right? So sometimes you just need to basically get what you can to pay the bills and grow your business. We did commercial, small commercial for the first three years. We literally uh, actually last year had two. Uh, we dropped one and then one canceled. We're strictly residential now. We know what our sweet spot is. We know what our, our best practices are, and that's what we want to scale. And sometimes that takes a couple of years, you mm -hmm. know, to kind of figure out what you need. So I think in the beginning, it's totally okay to go bid a couple of commercial properties. It does help with revenue in the winter time frame. Yeah. Um, typically commercial pro, uh, commercial customers, it's a race to the bottom. It's a race to the lowest price because you have a lot of companies bidding on that. And the only way typically if you, if you see a successful commercial only company, they have very cheap labor working for them. And that is the only way you're going to make money uh, as a commercial company is um, taking advantage of your labor, to be quite quite honest with you, or having ridiculous markups on your on your plants and having good relationships with wholesalers to get bottom prices on plants. Um, that's the only way you're going to make money as a commercial company. We do 100% residential, although we do have a few commercials. But the reason I say 100% residential is because we treat those commercial accounts as residential customers, uh, because although they're running a business out of their spot, it still kind of looks like a home. Um, so that's, we, we do all residential and that's typically where you're going to make your money. Uh, you can make a lot of money top line with commercial with very little customers, but with residential, you're going to have a lot more people blowing up your emails, but it'll make a lot more profit. Absolutely. All right. Last question yeah, of the day, Leonardo, I'll let you take this one. All right. When someone has a license, he could approve his garden machines with diesel engines for lawn care as lawn tractors. Leonardo, I'm, I'm sorry, brother. I'm not sure what you're asking here. Um, let me try to, let me try to help you out. When someone has a license, he could approve his garden machines with diesel engines for lawn care as lawn tractors. Yeah, man, I'm sorry. I, if, if this is an equipment question, I would hundred percent recommend you reach out to your local dealer and, and maybe pick their brain on, on the equipment question that you'd have for them. Yeah. Okay. One last one that came in. Have you guys ever experimented with annually billing your clients? We have not. And the reason why is, well, actually, let me, let me, let me, re, let me take that back. So two years ago, we did offer prepays for our weed control customers where we would uh, give them a 10% discount if they prepay. And that actually worked pretty well. The reason why you would want to do that is if you don't have the cash up front to scale. That makes sense. Because if you can get, you know, 25, 30 customers to prepay to where you get five, 10, $15,000, then you can go and buy your big spray rig or, you know, second truck or whatever that is. 
Um, that the only time to me that would make sense is if you're hurt, if you're hurting for cash is when you would want to prepay. So that way you can get the equipment to go and do the services because you are typically giving them that discount of like that 10%. But um, outside of that, now that we're not hurting for cash and we're not trying to grow super, super tremendously, uh, we don't, we actually got rid of the prepays because we're technically losing 10% of that revenue by, you know, that the customers are going to stay with us anyway, because we do good quality of work and things like that. So you are trading some cash to get it immediately, but there are times that you may look at that as an avenue, but we don't do that anymore. Yeah. We, uh, we experimented it with, we experimented with that this year. So we reached out to like 50 of our, um, like long-term loyal customers and we asked them if they wanted to have a flat monthly bill. And what we found is it's it's a really good route if you want to increase the revenue per customer per year. So we turned people that were maybe just paying a hundred bucks a month in lawn mowing services to now they're doing like 250 bucks a month in flat monthly billing because we have two flower bed cleanups on there for a year, the fertilizer, et cetera. Uh, we found that it's that is the single easiest and quickest way to increase the total annual revenue per customer. The downside is it's a long sales process and it adds friction to the sales uh, process. And it's a pain in the butt to build out in your CRM, uh, which adds a lot of complexity to the office. We are not going to continue down the route of annual billing. We're going to finish off these annual agreements we have. Um, it was an exper experiment that's going to help us bring in maybe 9,000 bucks a month um, per month over the next 12 months. But the con is it, it takes a lot to build out and I'm the one that has to build them out in our software because it's too confusing to teach, um, our office staff. So we're going to move away from that. Absolutely. Next year. Awesome. Well guys, great questions today. We definitely appreciate you guys, everybody tuning in. Uh, we hope that you guys have a prosperous spring rush and hopefully this brought value to you guys to hopefully triple your business. And, um, Sam, thanks so much for, yeah, for yeah. hopping on. Uh, if you guys haven't already, like I said, he, he, uh, his YouTube channel is Sam Gustin and he puts out a lot of great content in the lawn care communities Go over there, show some support and uh, super knowledgeable dude, seriously. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah. Will, Will's the man. We appreciate all you guys. And, uh, I, I just, uh, I follow Will's lead in terms of content. So him and Mike Andy's are the guys to go to right now for, for uh, lawn care content. If you want some uh, some content as well, you can follow my page, but if you only followed Wills, you, you would get just as much, if not more. So that'd be good. Absolutely. Well, hey guys, thanks so much for spending your Saturday morning with us. Uh, we wish you guys the best and we'll see you next time. See you guys.